restructuring. So you now understand how incredibly important your thoughts are. Now let's talk about specific techniques you can do to change your thoughts. Again, this is probably the most important lecture of the entire class because of the fact that stress originates in the brain. And thoughts are what initiates the chain reaction of the model of stress. Every single cognitive restructuring technique involves self-talk or talking to yourself, and several involve use of what's called a power phrase, which is a word or phrase that has a strong positive connotation. So let's talk about a power phrase. Here's how it works. You say a short phrase in your mind or out loud. Out loud is better if you can, only if you can, like life's too short or this too shall pass or whatever you choose. It's a short power packed or profound phrase that's designed to get you to snap out of it or buck up. You say your power phrase whenever you encounter a particular stressor that warrants the phrase. In other words, the power phrase should match your stressor. Here's an example of a power phrase that you might use if you fail a class or get a poor grade on a test. Don't ever give up. Here's an example of a power phrase that you might use if you find yourself constantly getting angry with someone. Life's too short. Here are a couple of suggested power phrases. If these power phrases don't do it for you, feel free to create your own. First power phrase, keep it in perspective, or will this matter a year from now? Do you or someone you know have a tendency to blow things out of proportion? Perceptions or thoughts can become distorted and magnified entirely out of proportion to their seriousness. This cognitive restructuring technique involves simply making a conscious effort to take a step back when confronted with a stressor and objectively assess the type of reaction that's warranted. In addition to saying this phrase in your mind, you might want to remind yourself yourself that there are two rules to stress management. One, don't stress the small stuff, and two, it's all small stuff. It could be worse. This leads me to the next power phrase, which happens to be my favorite. It could be worse. This phrase somewhat overlaps with the keep it in perspective power phrase and is designed to do the same thing get you to see that things aren't that bad. A man went to see the doctor for a complete physical examination. The doctor called him a few days later and said, the lab reports are in and I have some bad news and worse news. Confused and troubled, the man asked, what's the bad news? You have 24 hours to live, the doctor informed him. The lab reports are conclusive. In shock, the man could only say, but what's the worst news? Oh, that, the doctor answered casually, looking down at some papers. I meant to call you yesterday. Sometimes things go from bad to worse. Worse. Sometimes just when you see a light at the end of the tunnel, it turns out to be the headlight of an oncoming train. Here we have a guy who looks like he's about to be successful busting out of prison, but he's about to be very surprised. That's an outhouse up there with some flies swarming around in case you're not sure what that is. I completely understand that when you're hurting, it does little good for someone to tell you it could be worse. It already feels worse. I get that. And this technique may not work well for you if you're the type of person who tends to worry a lot. So if you think Think something could be worse, it might stress you out more because it might actually be worse. But our problems are really only a matter of perspective. A Persian saying goes, I cried because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. Remind yourself that Dr. Seuss, the most famous author of children's books, was rejected by 23 publishers before he finally got published. Michael Jordan, possibly the best basketball player ever, or at least one of the best, was cut from his high school basketball team. Albert Einstein, known to be the most brilliant man ever, produced a dissertation that was rejected because it was considered not good enough. Here's another example of how things could be worse. I am thankful for the wife who says it's hot dogs tonight because she is home with me and not out with someone else. For the husband who's on the sofa being a couch potato because he is home with me and not out at the bars. For the teenager who's complaining about doing dishes because it means she is at home, not on the streets. For the taxes I pay because it means I am employed. For the mess to clean after a party because it means I have have been surrounded by friends, for the clothes that fit a little too snug because it means I have enough to eat, for lawn that needs mowing, for windows that need cleaning and gutters that need fixing because it means I have a home, for all the complaining I hear about the government because it means we have freedom of speech, for the parking spot I find at the far end of the parking lot because it means I am capable of walking and I have been blessed with transportation, for my huge heating bill because it means I am warm, for the lady behind me in church who sings off key because it means I can hear, for the pile of laundry and 
ironing because it means I have clothes to wear, for weariness and aching muscles at the end of the day because it means I am capable of working hard, for the alarm that goes off in the early morning because it means I am alive. Here's a true story to further illustrate how things could be worse. For anyone who's had a tough day recently, I offer the following accident report submitted by a bricklayer in the West Indies. Believe it or not, this is a true story. My supervisor asked me to bring down some excess bricks from the third floor, so I rigged a beam and pulley, hoisted up a barrel, and tied it in place. After filling the barrel with bricks, I returned to the ground and then tied the rope, intending to lower the barrel to the ground. Unfortunately, I miscalculated the weight of the bricks. As the barrel started down, it jerked me off the ground so fast and so far, I was unable to let go. Halfway up, I met the barrel coming down and received a severe blow on the shoulder. I then continued to the top, banging my head against the beam and getting my fingers jammed in the pulley. When the barrel hit the ground, it burst its bottom, allowing the bricks to spill out. I was not heavier than the barrel, and so I started down again at high speed. Halfway down, I met the barrel coming up and received severe injuries to my shins. When I hit the ground, I landed on the bricks, getting painful cuts from the sharp edges. At this point, I must have lost my presence of mind because I let go of the line. The barrel then came down, giving me another heavy blow on the head and putting me in the hospital. So the next time you have a bad day, think of how it could be worse. Okay, here's one more illustration of how things could be worse. If you hate your job, just be thankful that you don't have this job. Things could always be worse. Again, this isn't rocket science, but using power phrases on a regular and consistent basis has been proven to be very effective. The power of the phrase is strengthened by repetition. So the more you remember to say it in response to a stressor, the more powerful or helpful it becomes in changing your perception, thought, and attitudes, which lessens the perceived severity of the stressor at hand. Of course, the power phrase is not going to magically make your stressors disappear, but it will help raise your tolerance to the stressor. Choose a stress time. So power phrases are specific phrases that you say. The next cognitive restructuring techniques require that you also alter your thoughts, but they may require you to do something as well, or there's not one specific blanket phrase that applies. Although it's obviously important to address your stressors and not ignore them, it's important not to dwell on them either. Choose a time to stress out about whatever and refrain from thinking about the stressor outside that stress time. A lecturer when explaining stress management to an audience raised a glass of water and asked, how heavy is this glass of water? Answers called out ranged from 20 grams to 500 grams. The lecturer replied, the absolute weight doesn't matter. It depends on how long you try to hold it. If I hold it for a minute, that's not a problem. If I hold it for an hour, I'll have an ache in my arm. If I hold it for a day, you'll have to call an ambulance. In each case, it's the same weight, but the longer I hold it, the heavier it becomes. He continued, and that's the way it is with stress management. If we carry our burdens around all the time, sooner or later, the burden becomes increasingly heavy. We won't be able to carry on. As with the glass of water, you have to put it down for a while and rest before holding it again. When we're refreshed, we can carry on with the burden. So before you return home tonight, put the burden of work down. Don't carry it home. You can pick it up tomorrow. Whatever burdens you're carrying now, let them down for a moment so you can relax. Pick them up later after you've rested. Life is too short. Enjoy it. So get into the habit of choosing a time and place to think about your stressors and do not allow yourself to dwell on it outside that specified time and place. Remember, you're in control of your thoughts. It's okay to have thoughts about your stressor pop in your mind outside your stress time. That's going to happen. But remember, you have control over your thoughts. If you're obsessing over something in and you're not within your stress time zone, get into the habit of gently bringing your thoughts to something else. And you can't say, don't think about that. Don't think about that. Don't think about that. What pops into your mind when I say, don't think about a pink elephant? <laughs> What just popped into your mind? A pink elephant. You have to replace thoughts of your stressor with thoughts of something else. Your mind needs something to think about. Find something else to focus on. Read a book, call a friend, watch a good movie, look through a photo album. You fill in the blank. But do something to occupy your mind outside your quote unquote stress time. And during your stress time, stress out all you want. Reframe with optimistic thinking. Another cognitive restructuring technique, similar to the power phrase, is 
catching yourself when you're thinking a negative thought and learning to immediately reframe or change that thought and turn it into a positive one. You can use a power phrase to snap you out of a negative thought. We are most likely to learn the traits of optimism or pessimism from our parents. However, even if the environment in which you were raised was a negative one, it is definitely possible to cultivate the aspect of optimistic thinking and gravitate toward a positive approach to life. Get into the habit of catching yourself when you're thinking negatively. Your subconscious mind takes what you say to yourself as reality, and your body can't tell what is real and what is not real. If you're thinking you're going to fail an exam, then your body responds as if you really did fail the test. So you put your body through the stress response without having even taken the test. Learn to pay attention to your conversation and strive to replace those negative thoughts with positive ones. Psych yourself up. Stress inoculation is a process to build up positive thoughts when negatively perceived thoughts are encountered. An example would be psyching yourself up immediately before giving a presentation. I can do this. I can do this. No problem. It will be over before I know it. I'm going to do a great job. You inundate yourself with positive thoughts before you encounter an expected stressor. Do you think there would be a difference in the quality of your presentation if instead you had a ton of negative thoughts going through your mind, such as, I'm going to look stupid, I'm going to fall flat on my face, I always blow it when it comes to public speaking? Reframe with humor. How would you rate your sense of humor? Do you have a sense of humor? Do you think having a sense of humor specifically about your stressors would help you deal with them better? You're standing in line at the grocery store or bookstore or wherever. Here are your thoughts. They never have enough help. Every time I come here, it's loaded with people and I have to wait forever to pick up a few lousy groceries. Reframe with humor. Aha, I knew it. Just look at all these people. I bet they bust them in here because they knew it was my day to shop. The manager probably called every coupon collecting customer she knows and asked them to get over here to stand in line in front of me. Another example of humor is the office copy machine when it breaks down. Here are your thoughts. Not again. This machine knew my job was an emergency. That's why it broke. If everyone else would fix it, when it jams, it wouldn't be broken now. What can you expect? Nobody cares. Refrain with humor. Broken again? Someone must have called in the serviceman whose job it is to jam copiers throughout the country. He has an impeccable reputation for ruining equipment and making people miss deadlines. This is his favorite office and I'm his favorite target. Whenever you encounter any stressful situation, think of how you can change your thoughts so that the situation becomes humorous. (laughs) Results of one study showed that children laugh an average of 350 times per day. How many times do you think they found that adults laugh in this study? The average adult only laughs an average of... 15 times a day. That's a huge difference. 350 versus 15. A note about laughter. Like exercise, laughing actually causes the stress response, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, etc. We've talked about how bad stress is or the stress response in your body. Why is laughing so good for you, especially when it causes the same physiological reactions as stress? <laughs> Immediately after you have a good laugh, there appears to be a relaxing effect. Your heart rate and blood pressure, for example, are lower than what it was before you laughed. Here are a couple more benefits of laughter. Remember, these benefits typically occur after laughing, not while you're laughing. Decreases stress hormones. Laughter has been shown in studies to decrease stress hormones that constrict blood vessels and suppress immune activity. For example, levels of epinephrine were lower in a group of subjects, both in anticipation of humor and after exposure to humor. Epinephrine levels remained down throughout the experiment. In addition, dopamine levels were also decreased. Dopamine is involved in the fight or flight response and is associated with elevated blood pressure. Provides cardiac exercise to an extent. Laughing is actually aerobic providing a workout for the diaphragm, which increases the body's ability to use oxygen. A good belly laugh is equivalent to internal jogging and can provide good cardiac conditioning, especially for those who are unable to perform physical exercises. Don't get me wrong, don't rely on laughing instead of exercising. Perpetuates positive emotions. Laughter brings in positive thoughts and emotions, which we know can positively affect our physiology and health. Humor changes how we feel. We can experience humor and 
and feel depressed and anxious or angry at the same time. So laughing provides a nice break from stressful emotions, reduces anxiety associated with performance. People who experience performance anxiety can be asked to envision a situation in their life where they experienced humor. They can be assisted to recall the situation when they're anxious or having a panic attack before performing or giving a presentation, for example. The humor situation actually serves two purposes. First, it reduces anxiety by substituting the feelings of humor for the anxious feelings. Second, while recalling the situation, the person is distracted from the anxiety-provoking thoughts and therefore the anxiety is reduced. Helps reduce pain and aids the healing process. In a study published in the Journal of Holistic Nursing, patients were told one-liner jokes after surgery and before pain medication was administered. Those exposed to humor perceived less pain when compared to patients who didn't get a dose of humor as part of their therapy. When you laugh, there are muscles throughout your body that contract, but the muscles that do not participate in the belly laugh actually relax. After you finish laughing, those muscles involved in laughter relax as well. Enhances respiration. Frequent belly laughter empties your lungs of more air than it takes in, resulting in a cleansing effect similar to deep breathing. Laughing is especially beneficial for patients suffering from emphysema or other respiratory ailments. Perhaps the biggest benefit of laughter is that it's free and has no negative side effects. There's actually a worldwide laughter club that was started in 1995 by a doctor. People thought he was crazy when he tried to round up some people for a group laughter session at his neighborhood park in Bombay. There are about 5,000 clubs worldwide now. First it spread throughout India, then to Europe and Asia, and most recently in North America. Just an FYI, there are three laughter clubs in California, one in Pasadena, one in Encinitas, and one in Ventura. He says we have the saying, fake it till you make it. It doesn't matter whether you are really laughing or not, you will still get the benefits. We do laughter as a form of exercise at the beginning, then it turns into real laughter very quickly. Here's one last illustration of how someone was exhibiting a good sense of humor. Enjoy the here and now. Learn to place importance on the here and now, this very minute, actually this very second. This is also called mindfulness training. Most of what we worry about are things in the future or in the past. If it's happened, it's happened. There's nothing you can do at this point. If it hasn't happened, it hasn't happened. So why are you stressing out about it? I'm all for preparing for future events, but there's a big difference between preparing and worrying. It's thought that about 90% of what the average person worries about doesn't come true. It was unnecessary worry. So you put your body through the stress response unnecessarily. And again, when you worry about something happening, it's as if it already happened in a sense because your body reacts to whatever your mind is telling it. Worrying is like a rocking chair. It's a lot of work, but you don't get very far. The following illustrates the importance of learning to enjoy the here and now. A friend of mine opened his wife's underwear drawer and picked up the silk paper wrapped package. This, he said, isn't any ordinary package. He unwrapped the box and stared at both the silk paper and the box. She got this the first time we went to New York eight or nine years ago. She has never put it on, was saving it for a special occasion. Well, I guess this is it. He got near the bed and placed the gift box next to the other clothing he was taken to the funeral house. His wife had just died. He turned to me and said, never save something for a special occasion. Every day in your life is a special occasion. I still think those words changed my life. Now I read more and clean less. I sit on the porch without worrying about anything. I spend more time with my family and less at work. I understand that life should be a source of experience to be lived up to, not survived through. I no longer keep anything. I use crystal glasses every day. I'll wear new clothes to go to the supermarket if I feel like it. I don't save my special perfume for special occasions. I use it whenever I want to. The words someday and one day are fading away from my dictionary. If it's worth seeing, listening, or doing, I want to see, listen, or do it now. I don't know what my friend's wife would have done if she knew she wouldn't be there the next morning. This nobody can tell. I think she might have called her relatives and closest friends. I'd like to think she would go out for Chinese, her favorite food. It's the small thing that I would regret not doing if I knew my time had come. Now I try not to delay or postpone or keep anything that can bring laughter and joy into our lives. And on each morning, I say to myself, this could be a special day. Each day, each hour, each minute is special. Have the attitude of gratitude. Do you have more than one pair of shoes? More than one change of underwear? Have you eaten six meals within the last two days? If you answered yes to all three questions, it's estimated that you are in the top 5% of people alive in the world today. Being grateful for all the little things in daily life is just as important as being grateful for the big things, such as finding a great job 
after graduating. A father noticed that his little boy had a huge smile on his face. The father asked his son, what are you thinking about? With a huge smile on his face, the son replied, candy. What is the source of your smiles? What simple things such as candy bring you happiness? Appreciate the little things. This kind of overlaps with have the attitude of gratitude, but the emphasis is specifically on the little things. Learning to consciously recognize and enjoy the daily little things, such as finding a great parking spot or chocolate Oreo shakes, might be more important than you think. The following illustrates the importance of appreciating the little things in life. I am hereby officially tendering my resignation as an adult. I have decided I would like to accept the responsibilities of an eight-year-old again. I want to go to McDonald's and think that it's a four-star restaurant. I want to sail sticks across a fresh mud puddle and make a sidewalk with rocks. I want to think M&Ms are better than money because you can eat them. I want to lie under a big oak tree and run a lemonade stand with my friends on a hot summer's day. I want to return to a time when life was simple, when all you knew were colors, multiplications, tables, and nursery rhymes. But that didn't bother you because you didn't know what you didn't know and you didn't care. All you knew was to be happy because you were blissfully unaware of all the things that should make you worried or upset. I want to think the world is fair, that everyone is honest and good. I want to believe that anything is possible. I want to be oblivious to the complexities of life and be overly excited by the little things again. I want to live simple again. I don't want my day to consist of computer crashes, mountains of paperwork, depressing news, how to survive more days in the month than there is money in the bank, doctor bills, gossip, illness, and loss of loved ones. I want to believe in the power of smiles, hugs, a kind word, truth, justice, peace, dreams, imagination, mankind, and making angels in the snow. So here's my checkbook and my car keys, my credit card bills, and my 401k statements. I'm officially resigning from adulthood. Look for the good and the bad. Once upon a time, there was a farmer and his son had only one horse and it ran away. The neighbor said it was bad luck. But then the horse came back with three wild horses following it. This seemed like good luck until the son trying to ride one of the wild horses fell off and broke his leg. Bad luck, it turned out. Except soon after the accident, the military military generals swept through the valley, taking all the able-bodied young men off to a terrible war. The son, of course, was spared. Within every gift lies adversity. Within every adversity lies a gift. Usually there's a lesson to be learned in our trials and challenges. Don't let these trials be for nothing. In other words, learn as much as possible from your challenges so they don't go to waste, per se. Looking for positives in a negative situation can dramatically alter your perception and allow you to deal more effectively with the stressor. The supplemental video for this lecture is Interview with Dr. Frankel and is about eight and a half minutes long. Dr. Frankel died quite a while ago, so it's a very old video, but it's good. He has somewhat of a thick accent, but listen to what he says. It's amazing what he survived in the concentration camp during uh, World War II. Key points. Cognitive restructuring techniques include use of a power phrase, a short powerful phrase that's designed to snap you out of it. Other cognitive restructuring techniques are choose a stress time, reframe with optimistic thinking, psych yourself up, reframe with humor, have the attitude of gratitude, 